um, I hear some of you are students, um, and so I've got a couple of questions uh, that you can use the, the technology in front of you. So, um, there's A, B, C, D, E. Um, I don't know how many options you have, but roughly how much did the Nigerian government spend per citizen in 2018? Um, and so, let's see uh, what, what options we get. Um, so, the answer is roughly $120, all right, um, per, per citizen. All right, so we're going to, same question, but now America is the country in question. So if Nigeria was roughly 120, America, um, yeah, the, the, the answer is uh, e, roughly 12,000. Um, and this is at the federal level. Um, the reason I started with that is um, because when you look at that and you say, well, why don't they have the roads fixed, all the schools, all the hospitals, good governance, and so on, this really puts their circumstance into perspective, right? Um, and I do this just to highlight how important the role of entrepreneurs and innovation is. Uh, because on the one hand, um, I do want uh, many governments in the world to be better, especially poor countries. I want them to build the roads, schools, and so on. But at the same time, when we look at the reality of the circumstance they find themselves, um, that's, a, that's a really tough, tough call for them. Um, and that sort of gives you an idea how, how we wrote this book. Um, Nigeria is not even doing as bad as, say, a Somalia, where it's like $25, $30 up per <coughs> So hopefully that gives you some perspective into where many of these countries are coming from. So this is Clay. Um, and I, I, I love talking about him because he, he changed the way I think and the way I see the world. Um, and my job today is to do my best to just introduce you to a couple of ideas in our book. Um, I can't do the whole book justice. Um, to maybe reframe the way you think, uh, the way you see innovation's role in uh, creating prosperity. But one of the big things that Clay harps on um, is the importance of theory. And, and the focus um, of today is really sort of combining ideas he had in his first book uh, with some new ideas we have in the prosperity paradox. Um, and he applied innovation to uh, competition and industry in, in the Innovator's Dilemma, which is sort of the book that was his claim to fame. And we've now taken that concept and we've applied it to economies and how it can impact uh, economies. And at the root of all his his books um, and ideas is the, the notion of management theory. Um, and we all wake up every day with questions in our minds, right? What classes do I take? What do I go to school? If you're an investor or a manager, you're asking different questions, right? Um, should I buy this company? Should I sell? Should we invest in this resource? Should we not? Should we hire this person? Should we fire? So there are all these questions. And we can answer the questions sort of based on gut, like, well, look at these guys doing that, let, let me do what they're doing. Or we can use um, good management theories. And so Clay has sort of built his career based on um, coming up with these theories, and they act as um, tools, right? And so depending on the situation you find yourself, you say, hey, do I need an innovation theory to help me with that? Do I need uh, a jobs to be done theory? Um, do I need to step back and look at the business model and look at that theory? And so these theories really help drive a lot of the research we do um, and how we answer some of these questions. And often they, they would, the idea is that it leads you to uh, the right outcome uh, more often than, uh, than not. So the three ideas I just want to quickly share with you today are, um, the economy, uh, non-consumption, and consumption. I want to introduce you to that. Um, talk about how not all innovations are created equal, um, and, and really illustrate the power of market-creating innovations. And the third is um, um, just uh, something we're working on, the market-creating innovation lab. Um, so what you see here are three eccentric circles. Um, this is sort of how we think about the economy. Um, a lot of times when you hear the economy, it's it's a hodgepodge of, you know, you've got schools, 
hospitals, infrastructure, government, private sector. There's a lot going on. Um, but from an innovation perspective, we simplify it and say, look, if you look at these three circles um, and, and, and just take the population of any region, it could be a country, it could be a global economy, there are usually people in the smaller circle who have a ton of money, a ton of wealth, a ton of access, right? It's on a skill. Um, and as the circle gets bigger, um, you've got people with progressively less money, less access, less skill, um, right? And what we say is um, there is a ton of non-consumption, um, especially in the two automobile circles. Uh, now, it's a simplistic representation, and it's not as clean <coughs> as the circles, but you get the idea. And non-consumption is really just a simple phenomenon that says there are many people who would benefit from access to a product or a service, but because of the cost of existing products and services on the market, they can't access it at all. Right? It doesn't mean they don't have use for it or need for it. Uh, it's just the cost um, of what's available prevents them from getting access, and so they typically would go without. Um, to give you a quick example, um, if we look at how innovations in computing have evolved, what you find is that 60, 70 years ago, computers were as big as maybe this, this room, not even bigger. And you needed really highly skilled technical people to operate them. In addition, uh, they were extremely expensive. And so all these big organizations and universities could afford them. Um, but over time, they got less and less expensive, um, and they were democratized. And so more and more people in society were able to um, afford computers. And my guess is almost everybody, if not everybody, has a computer in their pockets um, right now, right? Because they've been democratized. And they're being further democratized in, um, in lower income countries. And so as, you, as we think about innovation and the impact, uh, it's in its ability to uh, democratize access. It did, that doesn't mean people didn't um, have use for computers at all. It's just that, you know, if, if mainframe computers were still the dominant way um, we did computation, um, there's no way I would have access to computers uh, and, and many of us uh, in, this, in this room. Um, and so we think about how you democratize an innovation and how it begins to impact people in these uh, outer circles. And the more access you can democratize, be it computing, healthcare, um, education, um, food, uh, you begin to see um, economic uh, development. Uh, <coughs> so these are just simple characteristics of the two economies. I like to show this just so um, you see that a lot of times when you're in the consumption economy, a market already exists and it makes sense if you want to invest in a particular product or service. But with non-consumption, oftentimes um, it doesn't make sense. People look at you like you're crazy. If you, if you look back at the history of Apple, for instance, it was sick to the computing thing. Um, it was founded by uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, right? Now, Wozniak, at the time he came up with the idea, he was actually working at HP. And he pitched the idea of the personal computer five times to people at HP, um, and it just kept shutting it down. Because they didn't see the value. The market didn't exist, and they just didn't see what the point was. Um, and so you begin to see the characteristics of these different markets, and how when you pitch um, an innovation, to a circle where there's no product or service yet, oftentimes you met with, I don't know if they can afford it, I don't know if they need it, I don't know what the point is, um, but there are ways that you can, you can figure out how to um, democratize access to people in, in those markets. Um, and so how, how do we do that? I think that's sort of where um, the, the next point is, right? How do we begin to democratize access? Um, and that's where, for us at the Institute and Clay, um, he, you know, so Clay is sort of the Silicon Valley, especially, he's sort of the godfather of innovation and disruptive innovation, um, especially. Um, 
one of the words he hates the most is innovation. <laughs> because it's like, what is innovation? Right? It means so many different things to different people. And so he actually, when he's having a conversation with you, he, he loves to make sure that the <coughs> language being shared is, is he, we're using a common language. And so for him, he does not like the word innovation much. Um, so for us, the value of innovation is in its ability uh, to democratize access from one circle to another. Um, but here's the thing, transitioning from one circle to another fundamentally requires um, you to create what we call a, a new value network. Um, that's just fa a fancy business word for um, how do you get your product from point A to point B, right? And so if you think about it, virtually every product, there's, there's a group of people who sit down, research, and design it, um, and then they figure out it's a very simplistic a value chain or value network, right? You, you manufacture, you distribute, you market, you sell, um, and if necessary, you do some after sales service, right? With each component in the value chain, right, you're adding cost to the product. Now, for you to go from mainframe computer to personal computer to a smartphone, you have to change the value network. And this is where you can create enormous value for people in society. As you change the value network from mainframe computers to personal computers to smartphones, right? You begin to, what ultimately happens is because you're serving so many more people in uh, progressively larger circles, you need many more people to make the product, market the product, sell the product, service the product, and many more people are now using the product. And so they ultimately become more productive. They now have more access right, to things that can make their lives productive. And so as we think about our work, it's really a very simple model is how do we democratize innovations right, that can make life better for people? Um, how do we increase the number of people that have access to the things that many of us in this room take for granted. Um, in doing that, in finding sort of a, a business model that can help us do that, what ultimately happens is um, you create a new value network that then hires a lot more people. Um, and as that happens, uh, you see society begin to become more prosperous. And it's an evolutionary process. Um, get it, uh, but that's sort of how, um, how the things play out. Um, to give another quick example, cars are about the same thing. You know, a hundred years ago, cars were like private jets today, um, and then a guy by the name of Henry, well, first of all, how many people have a private jet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, no, but um, they're extremely expensive and uh, difficult to um, to, to drive, right, those cars uh, 100, 120 years ago. And then Henry Ford comes around and says, I'm going to make a car for the average uh, American. Uh, many people who he told said that's never going to happen. Like, uh, some of his investors walked out of him and said, how do you make cars in a society where we don't even have roads, we don't have um, transportation laws? Like, that's not going to work. But, he figured out a business model, created an entirely new value network, and was able to democratize access to cars. And that led to so much development um, in the U.S. Um, and if, you know, how many folks know how we actually pay for our roads uh, today? Uh, building new roads and maintaining new roads. Tolls and taxes. Tolls and taxes. Okay, so. Um, that's true, right? Tolls and taxes. Taxes from um, you know, gasoline and, and rubber and the tires, right? And so think about paying for roads. So when you think about poor countries, for instance, right? And you think, man, they don't have good roads, so they can't maintain their roads. When you begin to think about how many cars they have on the roads versus how many cars wealthy countries have on the roads, you can begin to draw these connections and see, oh, there is a link between the construction and maintenance of infrastructure to the, um, to the democratization of, and innovation, 
right? You can begin to even estimate when you when you read a report in the Wall Street Journal, this country has built this new road and his you can actually assess and say, man, in a few years, that road is probably not going to do well. Why? Because the mechanism that makes it sustainable is not yet there. And that is where democratizing access comes from. Right? And that's the important, that's why we really take that very seriously. It's, it's, it's how we see innovation. Um, and so the three main types, just to to round that out. The first are market creating innovations. Um, these are innovations that transform complicated and expensive products into products that are simple and affordable so many more people in society could get access to them. At the core, they create growth, development, they create jobs. Um, but they need capital. Right? And so imagine going to a manager uh, requesting capital for a market that does not yet exist. Um, and so this is where Steve Wozniak was having issues, right? Because they, he needed capital to democratize computing for a market that didn't exist yet. And so you begin to see this dichotomy here. The second type of innovations, which are also important, are what we call sustaining innovations. Now, these are innovations that make good products better. Um, and so if you think about your phones uh, or your cars or even your university, um, if the University of Michigan had resources from 25 years ago, they had updated the classrooms, and updated the student center, um, yeah, it could still take in a lot of students, but it wouldn't be as vibrant a place, it wouldn't be as exciting a place to go to school. And so sustaining innovations are important, right? They make good products better. But when you really step back and think about it, from an access standpoint especially, um, they don't create <coughs> entirely new access for people who historically could not afford existing products on the market. Um, if you could not afford an iPhone 10, chances are you can't afford an iPhone 11. Um, but, you know, you've got more features on the iPhone 11. The engineers uh, at Apple are more excited. They're, they get to work on cutting edge stuff. And so there's a lot of value. But when you step back and think about the impact, it's replacative in in character. Now, you don't need an entirely new manufacturing plant or distribution to get the products out um, to, to people. And the third type um, are what we call the efficiency innovations. Um, now efficiency innovations are, um, they're probably the, the, the most interesting uh, types of innovations uh, because they're also important but they especially sort of have a detrimental impact on uh, an economy. And so think about um, when an organization decides to outsource uh, jobs to uh, a region where um, they, they can do production, for instance, at a lower cost. Or think about when they um, get automation into their operations and people lose, um, lose jobs. Now, why they're interesting is, you know, if you as a company don't invest in efficiency innovations, your competitors will invest in efficiency innovations and they'll blow you out of the water. However, um, when you invest in them, it's important to know that they will probably have a particular type of impact on, uh, on an economy. Um, one industry in particular that is notorious for investments in efficiency innovations are uh, the resource extraction industries. Um, so you will see a country like Nigeria um, or Angola, they have a ton of oil, um, oil and gas. But these are efficiency innovations because the, the typical manager in that industry is thinking, how do I reduce costs so that I can extract this resource as cheaply as possible? So they don't necessarily think about democratizing access because the prices are set on sort of a global, um, global markets. So they just think about reducing costs. And so if you go to many countries that have a ton of efficiency innovations, what you'll find is um, in those industries, there's not really a ton of job. Um, they release cash flows that are important uh, for the viability of organizations. But if those cash flows are not reinvested back into market creating innovations that could then create jobs and democratize access, what you find is that the cash typically goes to a select few um, and this then increases uh, inequality. Um, right? 
right? So, so these are the three types of innovations. And what we try to do in the book in chapter two is explain these in detail and then really focus on how market creating innovations uh, impact uh, development. Um, I've talked about some of these um, ideas in that with market creating innovations, uh, typically the payback is a bit longer. Um, and the market doesn't exist, and there's internal process uh, of misalignment. Because you know, every company is designed to, to do what it does um, better. Um, right? So if you're a company that makes cars, you are designed to figure out how to make and sell uh, better cars, um, how to be more efficient, but how, how to add features that keep your uh, customers excited. Many companies are not designed to focus on creating new markets, um, especially markets that may ultimately um, undercut their existing products. Right? And so there is this sort of internal uh, process misalignment in, uh, in organizations uh, to go after market creating. Um, so I've got a, a, uh, a quick maybe show of hands or a quick uh, you can blurt out an answer. I'm going to read out some demographics for you and if you could tell me what country you think this is. Um, so this is a country where roughly 70% of people live in rural areas. Um, the average household spends um, more than half their income on food. One in five kids dies before the fifth birthday. 10% uh, of people uh, go to secondary school. Electrification is sub 20%, right? 10%. Life expectancy is 45 years, right? which means um, I would be in my twilight years now if I lived here. And some of you chuckling wouldn't would go be here, so um, <laughs> I am kidding. Um, I, um, so what, if, if, you, if you were reading a report in a newspaper and you saw these demographics, what countries would come to mind um, if you were reading this? DRC, that's an excellent one. Um, I'll give just two more guesses. There are no wrong answers. Nigeria? India. India? That's another good one. One more. Sorry? Pretty much any developing country. Okay, so that one just sort of covers it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, I like that. That's your good poker play, your hedging. Um, uh, so this, this, these are demographics of uh, these United States of America. Um, this is probably my favorite slide whenever I go and speak. Um, now, it's not America today, so don't freak out. Oh my gosh, <laughs> why did this happen? Um, but this is the U.S. Um, you know, anywhere from 100 to 150 years ago. And the reason I like this is not to say, you know, you can sort of draw a one-to-one -one map of America then and many poor countries today. But the reason I love this is it just shows where America has come from and how development is possible for many poor countries. It's an evolutionary thing that can happen. But I think we have to get the mechanism right. Because when America had these demographics, um, and you looked at how much the government spent per citizen, it was on par with many poor countries today. If you looked at corruption in government, uh, which we, we explained in chapter nine in our book, um, you will see widespread corruption and mismanagement and embezzlement of funds. Um, if you looked at the level of the state of America's institutions, many didn't even exist. Um, but the ones that did, I mean, judges were extremely corrupt and were in the pockets of big, uh, big corporations. Uh, if you looked at infrastructure projects, um, there's a book called The Big Roads that says, you know, uh, for municipalities, they got a dime worth of roads for every dollar they spent. Right? And so you begin to just sort of look at the state of things back then and where it is today. America is not a perfect country, but it's very different from where it has come from. Um, and what we found as we were 
um, doing the research is not um, that one day everyone in government had this sort of come to Jesus moment and they said, we got to stop stealing money, we got to build the road right, we got to take care of the poor, we got to, you know, that's not it at all. What happened was um, market creating innovators created new markets, employed a ton of people. Those people became more prosperous over time and began to fight the government, saying, well, you can't keep doing this. You can't keep behaving this way. Right? And uh, that's a very quick summary of American history of how it became prosperous. But when you look at that mechanism, right, you, you can't divorce the power of market creating innovations uh, from America's story. And so I think it's important for us to step back and look at where governments are today in terms of how much they have to spend and um, where the, even the countries like the U.S. came from um, and how they've been able to achieve its <coughs> prosperity. And so what does this uh, market-creating innovation look like? Um, like a pack of noodles, actually. Um, so I grew up in Nigeria, and this is a very uh, famous food in Nigeria. I'll tell you the story and why I think democratizing access is absolutely critical. So about 30 years ago, 1988, uh, these two brothers look at Nigeria and they say, um, man, there's a lot of poverty in the country. The country is ruled by a military regime. 80% of people um, live on less than $2 a day. I mean, you name it, it just did not scream <coughs> at the investment destination. I'm going to go there and invest. But instead of looking at the country and saying, um, I'm going to go build a lot of schools, a lot of hospitals, and so on, they said, let me see how I could get a pack of noodles to as many Nigerians as possible. No, no joke. Now, at the time, to appreciate this, most Nigerians didn't need noodles. So they actually, we, I guess, thought they were worms at first. Um, now you're laughing, but if you've never seen noodles, they do look wormy. <laughs> but these guys figured out a business model. Um, they figured out how to get the foods uh, into every corner of the country. And just to give you an idea of the impact trying to get a pack of noodles uh, to the average person in Nigeria has had, um, you, 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 get, you, you get an idea, right? So from a country where nobody ate noodles, you now have like 16 other, other companies that are making uh, noodles. You've got over uh, half a billion dollars in, um, in investment right, to build uh, factories. Uh, you've got tens of thousands of jobs that are created. Uh, the, com the, the company now um, um, has as part of their division the biggest um, corporate logistics company in the country. And so the, the point of showing this is a product as sort of flimsy as a pack of noodles has this much um, economic weight and activity behind it. Um, now, as we say in the book, right, one pack of noodles is not going to create prosperity in Nigeria. Right? It's like, one Model T is not going to create entire prosperity in America, right? Um, but the mechanism and the process by which um, they went about creating this new market is what I think uh, is exciting for us. And if we can share this message far and wide um, to begin to change how we think about development and innovation, I think we can have a lot of progress. The same thing happened with cell phones. Um, this is a story that's been told one too many times, um, but I think it's a good story because we forget how improbable it was 20 years ago to go into Africa, um, yeah, as some of us thought it was a country, um, <laughs> to, to, um, to, to say I'm going to invest billions of dollars in telco infrastructure um, in an industry that has to interplay with governments, right, where there's a ton of corruption and poverty and so on, um, to democratize access to phones, right? I mean, it was highly improbable. Mo Ibrahim, uh, Strive Masiwa, and many of these guys said, oh, I'll, I'll give this a shot. And now you sort of see the impact um, it's having. And many other innovations are built on top of this. Um, again, this is not going to 
create prosperity for the entire continent. But I think this it gives us an idea of how prosperity can begin to emerge. Um, after you create so many jobs, you create an entirely new industry uh, that inspires new generations of uh, innovators. You can begin to see how um, um, how this can have significant uh, development impact. Uh, not to mention the, the people who invested in this. I know this is the School of Social Work, and so we don't maybe talk about money a lot, but um, they became extremely wealthy. So, <laughs> so I throw that in there. That's sort of your thing. Um, all right, I will do one, one last question. Um, let's see, I've been talking for too long. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry, this is annually. I realized after I sent the slides, I didn't put annually. It's like monthly or daily. Um, I think you'd be surprised. Um, so how many people globally uh, earn uh, more than $7,500 annually? Excellent. All right, so we're about 31, that's about right. Um, yeah, so you guys are, you're sort of getting the hang of it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, so it's about, oh my God, I gotta hit the graph. Did I mess it up? Okay, good. Um, so you're right, it's about 16-ish percent. Uh, Pew Research uh, did a study, um, yeah, 2015 it came out, and um, they found out the global middle class is not as big as we thought. Now, when we put this in perspective, um, when you begin to look at this number, $7,500 a year, right, annually, that means the majority of people in the world are non-consumers. The majority of people can't stomach um, a major catastrophe that happens to them. They live in societies where they can't even really fall sick. Um, I mean, I know we have issues with our healthcare system. Um, but they live in countries where they, they can't even take sick days, right? And so for, for, for me, for us, it really underscores the importance of how we think about innovation's role in creating these products and services for people. Because if you remember how I started this, as much as, you know, let's even assume for one second governments want to help, right? Let's assume that, like, they, wake up every day thinking, how can I help these folks um, in my country? At $100, $150 a year per citizen, I, I, would, I would argue it's impossible for them, right? Um, and so it's incumbent on us uh, to figure out how we can um, democratize innovations that can have access. Um, so it's, I think it's an important um, an important lesson. Um, here are just a few companies uh, doing this. I, I met these at, uh, um, at my last trip to Nigeria. Um, you can look them up. Um, um, Cobo 360 is democratizing distribution and logistics. Um, Max.ng is similar with urban transportation. Um, Microinsure um, with insurance. Um, they, they now have over 60 million people on their insurance platform. And these are people who earn less than three to five dollars a day, um, and they're able to get some form of insurance, whether it's health insurance, life insurance, or uh, accident insurance. The policies are not going to pay out like our policies pay out, but again, right, they, they don't have to at this level. Um, and over time, I think things like that will grow. And MedShaft is um, investing in making pharmaceuticals more, uh, more affordable. Um, and so, um, what I want to end with is what we're trying to do at the Institute. Um, we really want to create a lab where we can make it a lot easier for people to democratize um, access. Um, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to go figure out how to democratize an innovation, um, we want to create the resources and tools to help. Similarly, if you're an investor thinking, um, you know, yeah, you've got to make returns, but how do you democratize access to certain um, innovations. Um, we we want to create a space where there are um, 
there are entrepreneurs uh, that you can look at, uh, so, so you invest in. So I'll just end with this uh, uh, quote from Henry Ford that says, the highest use of capital is not to make more money, but to make money do more for the betterment of life. Um, so thank you guys for your attention and for participating. In take around to take some questions. Who has a question? Make sure it's a good question. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Saba. I'm a first year student at the Ross Business School here at the University of Michigan. So you mentioned that um, in order to create these market innovative solutions that you need access to capital. So I'm curious as to how you view foreign direct investment and if you view that as a way to create the market solutions or do you feel it's more an efficiency solution? Yeah, so FDI. Um, so I'm assuming well, foreign direct investment is capital that comes into your country for long-term projects. <coughs> So there's foreign portfolio investment, um, which is shorter term. So companies that would um, that would invest in your stock market, for instance, they can pull out a lot uh, quicker than if I build a plant, right? So plant FDI stocks FPI. Okay, so that's the distinction. So to answer your question, um, I think um, no, I'm very sorry. I think it depends. Um, now, why does it depend? Um, if you look at our numbers, um, many African countries have attracted FDI over the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. And China is investing a lot now in, 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 in Africa, as an example. Um, but the reason it depends is, um, what is that FDI funding? So I don't necessarily get excited when I see FDI go into a country. I have to ask, is the FDI being channeled at um, market creating innovations or sustaining or efficiency innovations. And to sort of bring that to light, um, I mean, sorry for all my assumptions, uh, I would assume many of us are familiar with NAFTA. Um, and if you were not, I'm sure President Trump has talked about it enough that you are now familiar, at least, uh, with NAFTA. Now, NAFTA was signed in 1994, uh, President Bill Clinton. Um, so it's a trade deal. Um, between U.S., uh, Canada, and Mexico, yeah? Um, now, at the time, um, many experts saw it as an opportunity for Mexico to become sort of wealthy, like uh, the U.S. and Canada are wealthier. But when that happened, um, a lot of um, manufacturing jobs went to Mexico, um, and we would categorize those as uh, efficiency innovations. And so Mexico saw a huge boost in FDI. I think they were averaging three, four billion. Um, now it's probably around 40, 50. Um, but the last couple of years might be might be a little rough. Um, but um, if you look at Mexico's sort of ascendancy in terms of economic uh, um, growth and poverty, um, more than half. Or about half the people in, in Mexico are still below the poverty line. Um, and so it's not to say the FDI was bad, but efficiency innovations typically don't have the distributive effect that market creating innovations would have. Um, and so people who built those plants, they were able to do their operations at lower cost. They made more money for their shareholders, but that didn't quite diffuse in the Mexican economy. Um, as we would expect. In the same way, many investments in uh, the resource extraction industry, which is where many African countries have invited FDI, have not really diffused to affect the whole economy. And so, in the one sense, um, FDI can be really good. Um, if you look at the way FDI impacted uh, Singapore, uh, South Korea, even China, um, you know, and the U.S. And for the U.S., you have to go back much farther. Um, but um, if you look at 
how we've taken, like countries taking FDI, you, you sort of have to look at what is the FDI doing? And so it's a nuanced answer, but um, I would say if I were a policymaker, um, I would try to attract the kind of FDI that creates markets in my country. Um, I wouldn't shun the others, but I, I would just know it's not going to have as much of an impact um, as, as I might want. So, so. All right, thanks very much for the talk. It was a uh, nice layout of the innovation. Uh, I guess I have a similar question to that, which is I'm also curious, I'm trying to grab what, what this means for policymakers. So in terms of R&D to support or the three types of innovation, is there an area you think policymakers should focus on? If we provide cars, then the roads will follow? Or is this not just a focus on one issue? Yeah, so um, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. And, and I'll, be, I'll be the first to tell you um, I cringe whenever I get questions about what should policymakers do. Um, because the sort of short answer um, is I'm not 100% sure. I really don't know. Um, the way I would respond, uh, which I hope doesn't sound like a cop-out, is um, the first thing is just understanding in the event that you you care enough to understand this um, largely. And I say that because many policymakers in um, most countries now that are at least democratic, um, they have this sort of four, well, two to six year cycle. Um, they raise a lot of money to get elected. When they get elected, they sort of have favors they have to dole out. And so those are real um, pressures that they are under. So in the event that they can overcome those and say, okay, I want to actually make change and policy for the better. Um, the first is understanding, just understanding the three types of innovations and how they might impact your region, right? Um, and then the second is focusing, uh, creating policies um, that prioritize productivity, <coughs> not just profitability. And so what does that mean? Um, if, say, there is a pharmacy in um, the biggest pharmacy in Kenya, or some other country where access to drugs is not, um, is not as, as, as readily available, my policy um, would essentially be, okay, for you to keep getting whatever benefits you're getting, um, you have to make sure over the next five years, this many more people have access to drugs. So that forces the companies um, to develop or create new markets. Now, what that looks like on the ground, how it plays out, I don't know. But when, when, when you look at policies and regulations um, in, again, really even rich countries, um, what ultimately happens is um, because politicians and, and um, the wealthiest in society uh, typically talk, um, they're in constant communication. And so remember those three circles I drew? Um, you know, the, the richest are in the smallest circle, and they have access to politicians and everybody. Um, typically, policies promote sort of rent-seeking, um, and which increases profitability, not necessarily productivity. And so insofar as you as a policymaker can create policies that will prioritize productivity, um, I, would, I would do that. Um, in terms of how that connects to FDI, I love what um, I love what like China did, for instance, where you come into the country, um, you got to partner with a local Chinese firm in some way, and if you know if, if you don't share the technology, then then you're gonna share the technology whether you like it or not, right? Um, and what happens is today um, today China is not just making you know, cheap t-shirts and, and shoelaces of sort of, you know, cups. They're making the nice technology products, right? And so if you as a policymaker can attract FDI, make the conditions um, good for investors, but, but also say, look, you know, you gotta make sure you partner with a local firm so that we can grow our local base. Um, that's the route I, I would take. Hi. Um, so I really appreciate your uh, <coughs> opening with the reading. Um, 
your book, especially the sentence that talks about channeling our collective efforts. Um, but I also noticed throughout your talk that when it comes to innovation, you do also uh, encounter resistance to a change. So then how do you best balance kind of wanting to be pro-collective, pro-team, while also having the perseverance and resistance to continue to push forward an innovative idea? Um, uh, if I understood your question correctly, um, it's what I sort of want it's kumbaya, everybody come together, let's try to fix this thing. But at the same time, the message um, is going to be met with some kind of resistance. And so how do I manage that? Yeah, it's like yeah. with uh, Apple or with Henry Ford, with uh, all of these different people's journeys, there's always this moment where they're in a room and there's a lot of mm -hmm. naysayers mm -hmm. or people are resistant to the ideas that they have. Yeah. But it kind of does work. Yeah, I mean, um, so education is a big part of it. Um, that's why the slide about where America has come from is really important. Um, that's why we wrote the book the way we did. Um, there's a third section of the book we call the barrier section, and it really focuses on institutions, corruption, and infrastructure. Um, and we try to talk about these things in a way that help people see um, number one, it's a process. Um, this country wasn't built overnight. Um, but in order to be successful, we have to get the mechanism right. And we've been trying um, to sort of get the conditions in place for decades, um, especially in, in poor countries. So we've been trying to build institutions, build judiciaries, courts, and um, legislatures. Um, and those are good things to do, but if we don't have the complementary innovation piece, it's going to be incredibly difficult. So I think part of it is um, evangelizing the message um, and then finding key people um, who are very well resourced and connected, <coughs> who can then further uh, act as evangelists. Um, but you're right, it's, it's, it's sort of hard. Um, it's, it's, met, it's being met with a lot of resistance. Yeah, keep Other questions or comments? Um, I just had a question in terms of like what your advice would be or what you see as you know the best way to um, to connect like investors who maybe there's people at the local level who have these ideas who could be local entrepreneurs who know some other communities and could work you know, these ideas from the bottom up almost, but how do you get people like that who have these great ideas in poor communities or what kind of connected, you know, to people who have the resources? And what is the kind of view on that? Um, so it's partly why we are, we are really trying to figure out how to structure this lab. Um, the focus is going to be on um, a particular region. Um, in trying to identify these really highly talented individuals um, and then uh, giving them the language um, to, to be able to explain what they're trying to do in a way that can resonate with uh, investors um, or people with capital. Um, and then we're also very well placed to, to get access to these investors to at least listen. Um, I mean, being connected to Harvard Business School, um, like we are all, I mean, being here at the University of Michigan, we're all heavily resourced in that way. We don't have capital in our pockets, but we have access in that way. And so figuring out the infrastructure to connect that is what we're really thinking about now. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but we're, we're actively trying to figure Martha, thank you. I'm from a, I'm a PhD student in the School of Education, and so one of my questions is, where does the 
where and how would collaboration with educators in these kinds of economies fit and match and will support the kind of market innovation that you're talking about? So I get uh, questions in education a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, per se, education is very important. It's very important. However, um, if you think about education, as a um, as a as a as a way um, for people to improve um, their knowledge um, and experiences, so they can be more productive in an economy, right? Then you begin to see a lot of education in poor countries are just useless. There's just no point. You've got kids who go to school for computer science; they never see a computer. Um, you've got kids studying biology from the standpoint of how it impacts uh, Western diseases and there's no relevance or little relevance in their economies. And so if by education we mean how do we communicate um, knowledge in a way that can help this individual be more productive in their societies, uh, then I think education is absolutely critical. Um, and in a way, you could argue um, this lab is about education. But if education is what, you know, sort of a school, a building, teachers, you got to go through these things, then um, I think, again, we have to look at the relationship between education and the economy. And so, is University of Mich Michigan a land grant university? No? Okay. So, um, if you go, I'm not going to say, I was going to say Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are Lang Grant University. They, they suck. <laughs> <laughs> they um, but just in case I go speak there. <laughs> um, but if you look at um, the proliferation of, of higher education institutions in, in America, you will see this. Um, a beautiful relationship to what was going on in America at the time, the agriculture industrial revolution, right? And so insofar as we can create education institutions that help people in the economy become more productive in that context, we can, you cannot develop without education. Um, and so I think, practically speaking, um, not only us continuing to evangelize this message, but um, figuring out how we can partner with education institutions to say, hey, what are you teaching people? Do they understand the power of innovation? I mean, in, in, in um, schools that teach policy work or um, um, public administration, talking about the impact of entrepreneurship and innovation and how they think about policy. I think those kinds of things can ultimately make education more relevant in our societies. Could you say something about, um, I, I wasn't sure I was understanding you correctly on what you were saying about the different kinds of innovation Let me give you a couple things I'm thinking. So for instance, on the um, disruptive innovation, one of the things that's always got me about that is we talk about the examples of those that succeed, but there are enormous number of resources spent by companies, by individuals, and we never even hear about them. We don't even know what happened. So like from a company's perspective, I couldn't tell them that you know, it's your best investment is to go after something like that, because we don't even have data. We, we couldn't even say anything about it. And then some of the others you're talking about, the efficiency, the lowering cost, it doesn't seem like that's necessarily a bad thing. That, that's actually a very useful thing in a lot of the kind of that um, you're talking about. And, and the other one you're talking about was the losing jobs is an example. It moves jobs to another place, but not lost here, jobs gained there. And so it, it seems like they each have their place, and I, but I, I didn't know if you were making a comment on which one was good in particular situations. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you actually are struggling with that because I didn't make a comment on which was good or bad. Um, um, I think we, we are somewhat agnostic. Um, I'm not going to moralize the impact of an innovation. I think we, as a researcher, we sort of call it what it is. Um, and so efficiency innovations, we look at it from the standpoint of where the investment is happening. Um, and so if I invest in efficiency innovations in, say, the University of Michigan, and I I invest in a technology that eliminates 20% of jobs here, I'm focused on how that efficiency innovation affects the University of Michigan. Now, the idea that the 20% of jobs that are lost, they, they would go somewhere else and they would find other jobs, or they would, like, I think that's, um, it's, it's a consideration, um, but I think from the University of Michigan's standpoint, I think it's important to think about how the, the, the jobs that are lost would affect that economy. Um, and so, I mean, I say University of Michigan, but if you think of it as a local economy, if I'm a mayor or a governor, right, how will efficiency innovations impact my economy? Um, even though the jobs lost here are gained somewhere else, I care about my economy, so it's important for you to sort of understand how that impacts your economy. It doesn't mean you stop it, but you can prepare for it. So the people who lose their jobs, what programs are in place to get them um, either retrained to get other jobs? Um, how should you be making investments in your infrastructure to make sure that um, whenever efficiency innovation shocks happen, which they will, it doesn't rock your uh, economy as much as it should, right? And I think just understanding that I think is important. What we try to, to do in the book is not really say market create, create innovation good, all these others bad. We just try to illustrate the power of market creating innovations. Um, and I think that's where we spend a lot of our time. Um, the last thing I'll say on efficiency innovations is um, they reduce the cost of making a product, um, but they don't necessarily reduce the price of the product. And so when they make me more efficient, um, typically I take that money um, and I give it back to my shareholders or I, I figure out what I want to do with it. Um, but when we talk about market creating innovations, I mean, there is a, a, um, a seismic shift in the price of the product. We're talking, you know, um, mainframe computers to personal computers to smartphone type shit. But, but so in some of those examples, there are competitors there. So you don't have the luxury of returning it to your shareholders. When you're competing with other people, you're doing the same thing. And it, it often, I mean, we, we observe in competitive market that it does drive the price down. Yeah, it does. It drives the price down. But um, from a, yeah, so from a development standpoint, right, um, it, if you couldn't afford a car in America, if you can't afford, if you couldn't afford a Ford last year, no matter what kind of competition is going on in the industry, you can't afford a Ford this year, right? And so until, until the fundamental value network, right, on how you make Fords changes. Um, and so people who couldn't afford $2,000 computers, some of them can afford $100 smartphones, right? And I think that's the shift I'm talking about. So the fact that the computer goes from 2000, there's always a, a window, 2000 to 1900. I mean, there's always that happening, economic activity. But um, we're really talking about, I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at Mexico, there's a guy um, who in chapter seven we talked to, he's changing the way diabetes gets treated in Mexico. There are a lot of hospitals and clinics that treat diabetes, but it costs the average Mexican about $1,000 a year. He has figured out a model where he's reduced that to about $250. It was incredibly difficult for him to start, right? It was nothing like it, and many people said, impossible, this is not going to work. But now there are a ton of copycats, right, who, who are now saying, oh, wow, I could, I could make money and do that. And I think that's the kind of shift we're talking about. It doesn't mean there are no efficiencies in the $1,000 that 
and they, they take it down to 900, which is, which is huge. But it's not going to create an entirely new market that fundamentally changes the way people access a product or a service. You don't seem convinced. <laughs> That's all right. Hi, uh, I had a question about uh, what happens after markets are developed in poor countries. So, like, once prosperity kind of goes up in poor countries, what do you think is the next step in addressing corruption that may still linger in the governments over there? I mean, so I think the, the way we write about corruption um, is, is um, it, it happens on this spectrum, right? Um, and so the first sort of most obvious, like corrupt countries, we call over and unpredictable. So you go to a country and you don't know um, what the state of corruption is. You just know it's very corrupt, very low. And Transparency International's uh, corruption perception index is a good proxy. Um, well, the second phase is what we call covert and predictable. Um, now that phase is where I would put, say, a China today or a South Korea 15-ish, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and the third phase is, um, is transparent, um, where there's still corruption happening. I mean, there's corruption in yeah, everywhere you have people, I think you have corruption. But have the systems uh, being developed to help us uh, reduce corruption or to, to catch it um, in a way that can that can build trust in society, right? So those three phases. The mechanism in which you move from phase one um, to phase two is really by creating these new markets, right? It's often looked at uh, like the mechanism is to build institutions, but as we described in the institutions chapter, it's in, institutions are not just <coughs> A, a, a legislative system um, or, or uh, a judiciary system. They really are connected to the culture and the way people solve problems in society, right? And when people can make progress um, by means that are not corrupt, they would often choose that, but you have to give them that, that <coughs> option, right? And that's where the new market sort of gives you that option. Uh, as people become more prosperous, um, they, with their resources, now begin to elect officials who can fight corruption. Um, they now begin to create a vibrant civil society that can keep government in check. Um, and so if, if you look at the way the U.S. sort of evolved in terms of corruption, you'll see similar things happening. Um, there was a, um, um, it was, in, I think, if it was not in New York, I think it was in New York, um, early 1900s, where um, a, a, there was a very well-known politician, um, I think William Massey Tweed, um, he was known as Boss, Boss Tweed, um, he was part of sort of the democratic machinery at the time, um, and the governor of New York at the time would not prosecute him even though there was evidence that he was corrupt. And so there were these things in America coming up called good government clubs that were essentially concerned citizens who pulled resources together, raised money. So think of it as civil society. And they raised the money to be able to prosecute him. I think that process is sort of what has to happen. But it's incredibly difficult for people who are poor to marshal resources together to fight a government that's oppressive and extremely wealthy. And I think that's why that first step is, is absolutely important. Um, quick plug for a TED Talk I just gave on this, actually. Um, you just Google my name, TED Talk, you see it. Corruption. I should have remembered to say that. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's messy, it's evolutionary, but I think as more people gain more wealth, they're able to give the government a run for its money. Um, sorry. Say so no pun intended. Yes, it was. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I, I'm curious your thoughts on you know, for the 
goal of achieving lasting prosperity in the countries that we're talking about, uh, how important it is that these market creating innovations ultimately end up being homegrown innovations. So, you know, to take use your examples, I guess, I'm you know, a Nigerian and my noodles are made by Nestle and distributed by Nestle and I'm using a Samsung phone on the Airtel network and I'm driving on a Chinese made road to my job at Shell Oil. You know, is there a cap then on how much you know, prosperity my fellow countrymen can achieve when so many of those you know, the benefits of those innovations are going to other countries? Yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, I think there's no free lunch. Um, we get paid for um, being able to do really difficult things well that many people want, right? And so if you, if you, if you think about that, if it's really hard to do something that many people want it, and your company does that, you can create a ton of value and you'll be extremely, uh, extremely wealthy. Um, part of why market creating innovations um, are important is um, not only do they inspire copycats, um, most of whom are often local, um, they, there's this, um, this transfer of technical know-how um, or business know-how. Um, that happens as a result, all right? And so if I import all my Samsung phones, I, I import all my telco infrastructure, import all my noodles, or I don't, I don't add value in country, absolutely it's going to be capped, right? This, I mean, yeah, in some ways, when you make a product from another country and you ship it to, to a different country, you're, you're essentially importing the cost structure um, that, that made the product in that country. So if a German um, person in a manufacturing plant is making your car, um, you who is buying that car is paying the German pension and all those things. So there, there's going to be a cap. But I think when you, when you transfer that technology and you make it locally, um, which is a process, it doesn't happen overnight, then you can begin to um, make a lot more gains in terms of prosperity. So it's absolutely important, but it does not have to start with a local person. I think that's... Are there any last burning questions? If not, let's um, give our speaker a one last round.